Well, good evening. Good evening and welcome. Uh, it's a wonderful turnout in such a, such, a, such a miserable evening this evening, and we're very glad to have everyone. This is our, um, this is our third presentation uh, for the spring series of Oceans Alive. My name is Graham Guise, and I'm standing in for David Rawls, who unfortunately can't be here with us today. The Sea Grant program encourages protection and wise utilization of the, of the nation's marine resources. And it does that through research, public education, and advisory services. And the Oceans Alive series has been a successful component of the Sea Grant program. Thanks to the support that we've gotten from all of you and from our outstanding group of speakers. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, uh, let me remind you that next week uh, we'll hear from Don Anderson. Uh, from the Hui uh, Biology Department, and the title of his talk will be Poisons in Your Seafood, The Myths, Realities of Marine Biotoxins and the Red Tides. Red Tides is Don's specialty, and uh, he's known worldwide for his work, and it'll be very interesting. But especially interesting will be tonight's talk, one that I've looked forward to for a long time, uh, because tonight's speaker has been a friend of mine for, for uh, many years, I think many of you know Molly Benjamin through her columns on fishing and fisheries issues that appear in the Cape Cod Times and has for some 10 years now. Molly was trained as a biologist at Cornell and at the University of Colorado, but she's worn many hats uh, in her last 20 years on Cape Cod, including that of writer, naturalist, and businesswoman. I first met Molly, I guess it was um, oh, 18 years ago or so, uh, when I was at the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown, and uh, we were running a, uh, a, a uh, Earth Watch program with volunteers from all around the country, uh, but most of them not from the shore. Um, the particular program involved uh, uh, a benthic survey of Provincetown Harbor, and um, the group had chartered a boat, uh, which was called the Molly B, and I didn't know what the name referred to, uh, never seen the boat before, or its captain, and we went aboard, and I met the captain, Molly B., uh, for the first time. And um, I was awfully thankful uh, that the captain was, uh, was Molly Benjamin, because once we got out in the harbor, the questions came fast and thick. And um, while I knew something about the geology of the harbor, uh, my answers to the, most of the questions that were asked were, were uh, thin at best. But... Uh, to my surprise, the, the, the ship's owner and, and captain uh, provided answers that uh, not only satisfied the, the, uh, uh, the members of the Earth Watch team, but um, I recognized as, as uh, extremely authentic and, uh, and the voice of uh, both knowledge and reason. And in fact, uh, it's Molly's concern both for, for nature, uh, but those of us who use nature as a resource that balanced interest and concern for both that's so hard to achieve. It's her, it's her ability to combine those two that makes her such a wonderful resource for all of us here on Cape Cod. So I'm really happy to, to have Molly here and, and have the honor of introducing her. Molly's talk is Clammy Wynette and the Steamers, Clam Farming on Cape Cod. Molly Benjamin, welcome. I think I'm mic'd up here, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I've never understood why people think writers make good speakers. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll hope for the best. Um, and I thank Graham for that lovely introduction. That was, that was fun back in the old days when we were all younger. <laughs> um, thought I'd talk a little bit about who clam farmers are. There's, there's several hundred on, on Cape Cod. It's kind of a quiet industry. Um, the, the bulk of, of this kind of activity takes place on the lower Cape. There's some uh, shellfish growing in Ketuit, as you probably know, at Ketuit, Ketuit uh, Oyster Farm. Um, lately, I've really been distinguishing in my mind the differences between aquaculture and what we do, which is clam farming, or perhaps properly called shellfish propagation. Uh, to me, aquaculture really means deep water salmon farms, and, and that sort of thing. Shellfish propagation and clam farming 
is really basically what the Indians have been doing. The way I understand it, the Indians at the Pamet River in Turo were, were uh, you know, collecting their shellfish and protecting it a bit from predators and, and uh, quickly <clears throat> turned the uh, pilgrims onto their systems, this, the pilgr pilgrims, as is the want of uh, European Europeans, immediately uh, improved on the technology slightly, all very low tech, uh, and leading to what we do today, which, which remains qu very low tech, uh, labor intensive, but quite successful. Um, probably something in the neighborhood of a million clams per acre can be raised. The law requires that only barren tidal flat can be uh, leased to a private grower. And the state literally sends out biologists with rubber boots and clam rakes who will do an on-site uh, survey to make sure that, in fact, there's nothing real in the way of natural shellfish growing there that the public is being ripped off in no way whatsoever before they'll, they'll let a private grower lease it. Biologically, one of the effects when, when someone does lease it and starts planting clams, which is an out-of-pocket expense, is that the biological diversity of that piece of tide flat quadruples. And that's probably not a strong enough word. Um, your, your, your everyday average barren tide flat really is barren. You know, there's hardly any worms there. There's no periwinkles. There's no nothing. But as soon as you start planting clams there, and, and I'll explain a little bit more about it in a, in a minute, but you, you cover these up with a net, which is sort of like put a bed sheet, really, flat on the sand. And, and uh, algae grows there. And, and it's just amazing how much life in a year or two is focused in that little piece of area. And that, in turn, of course, brings the migratory birds, which feed on all the the stuff that you've got going on there. Um, it's done in a subtidal area, in between high and dead low tide. So that at high tide, you could go swimming there. At low tide, it's sand. Most of the shellfish leases in the state are typically two acres, acre and a half, two acres. Uh, how it works is that the clam farmer, which, who deals, by the way, with a gigantic bureaucracy, I have more licenses than I could possibly carry in my wallet in order to do all this stuff. But once you've gotten through the bureaucracy and you've got your, all your clam farmer licenses, you buy clams, and I'll pass some around, from a hatchery. These, the baby clams are about the size of a split pea. They're very tiny. There's some in this bag here. and I thought you might want to look at them. In three years, those clams will be ready for the half shell in a raw bar at Captain Kids or someplace. Uh, three years' time, you can, you can see the growth. At, at the end of the first summer, those little guys will be a, somewhere between the size, between a size of a dime to a quarter. That first summer, you've got them in these little, by the way, down here after, afterward, I've sort of got, brought a model clam farm which is flat, so I know you can't see it too well from where you're sitting. Uh, but feel free afterward to come down and look at it. You, the babies go in these little boxes, which, which in size and almost function are very similar to a single bed mattress. Just about the same size, same height, laying on the sand, basically. Inside the mattress, you've put sand, put in the clams, cover the thing over with this kind of green net that we've borrowed from uh, Italian olive farmers who use this net to catch their olives with, I understand, over in Italy. You cover it with the net. The, the key to clam farming, because nature provides the food and you don't have to shovel the manure, it's a funny mix between farming and fishing, you know? It's got strong elements of both. And like I say, you don't have to struggle, uh, shovel manure, and you don't have to feed, and you don't have to change diapers. You do have to come up with an awful lot of names, though, when you're, when you're planting half a million animals a year. It's terrible. <laughs> right now, I'm in the L section, Luigi and Lester and Le <laughs> Louise. <laughs> uh, 
But what you do have to do is protect them from pr predators. That, that's the whole, the whole key in a nutshell. So that, that's what the net is doing. Um, even then, you'll get, of course, hatches of green crabs or rock crabs or moon snails. And the larvae, the larvae forms of those animals will, will get in, of co into the box. And the only way to keep them out is if you had made your box out of quarter inch plate steel. And even then, I bet moon snails would figure out how to get in. Um, so some of them will get in no matter what. And of course, they're like a, a pig in a cafeteria once they're in there and each out of house and home. But those that survive, as I say, to the end of the first summer will be about the size of a quarter. Uh, the clam farmer then transplants, drains the sand out of the box, or lets the tide do it. You know, after a couple of days, it'll be empty and you'll be down to just clams. And sometimes you'll cull them into the bigger and smaller sizes, and then put them in a different part of your, your little one-acre plot into, into strips, and we call those strips races. And it's just a strip, and you just sort of take them up there and Johnny Clam seed along, you know. <laughs> just like you're planting grass seed, really. Uh, you, you're trying to do this at a, at a density of about 50 to the square foot. Um, you cover them over with a different kind of net, which you can see in the model. This is all made of the real nets that are used. Uh, the second season, they just lay there. They just sit there, they grow, they get eaten by more crabs and more, green, more moon snails. Um, the third season is, is when you can start harvesting. Uh, in Wellfleet, the town of, all of this was pretty much developed in the town of Wellfleet. About 10 years ago, they had most of it worked out. About eight years ago, they pretty much had most of the wrinkles ironed out. At that time, the town of Provincetown you know, sort of raided, it, raided and, and borrowed the whole idea and started doing it in Provincetown. Those two towns today have probably got the most uh, clam farms in them of any place on Cape Cod, in part probably because both towns have extensive tidal flats. Some towns also have extensive tidal flats, but have so much natural shellfish that if you remember, I, as I said, it can only be done in barren places so it couldn't be done like in the town of Chatham, which is loaded with shellfish. So there's really not the room to do uh, clam farms there. The, the, the kind of money we're talking about here is pretty amazing. Um, in Wellfleet last year, they landed the, just the clam farms. There's also a pretty good wild fishery going on in Wellfleet, as I'm sure you know. But the clam farms themselves landed more than a million bucks of farm-raised clams last year. That kind of money goes a long way in a rinky-dinky small coastal town, as you can well imagine. Spread out over at least, at least 100 families, probably more. Um, and it's expanding, of course, you know, as people, as people in Provincetown see the, 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 the pioneers starting to make money in it, of course, the, uh, the interest in it picks up. Some of the public benefits that I see from clam farming, oh, well, I see quite a few. Uh, one of them is shellfish themselves. One of the big uh, buzzwords that we're all worried about lately is nutrient loading of our coastal waters. Shellfish help reduce that nu nutrient loading by a tremendous factor. They've recently realized in Chesapeake Bay that when they started having water quality problems in Chesapeake Bay was when the oyster stocks there crashed. Because all those oysters were a tremendous filtration system. They all crashed mainly because of a disease called MSX, which has been a plague among oysters. When that happened, that's when their water quality problems came up. So for every bit of shellfish that, now all these people are, are, are doing this, as I say, out of pocket. The biggest expense to the person in the business is paying for the seed. It's, to be in a regular solid business uh, basis, you, you want to be planting about 10 grand worth of seed every spring, which is a pretty big chunk of change for most people. Um, 
how these uh, how the shellfish, of course, deal with nutrient loading is if you put a bunch of nutrient into the water, you get algae blooms, and the shellfish, of course, are are filtering out and consuming those those algae, and thereby reducing the the general uh, algae bloom very significantly. I've often thought with projects like uh, going on in Wakoit Bay, where nutrient loading is a tremendous problem, that if I were czar, which I don't ever expect to be, uh, I would plant shellfish or, or facilitate the planting of shellfish as fast as I could. There's, there's of course, quite a lot of natural shellfish there, but if you could pot, somehow increase the amount of shellfish there, you know that the amount of algae would go down, the eutrophication would drop, and so on and so forth. So for just on a general level, for the quality of the coastal waters, it it's a, has a terrific benefit. Another aspect to it sociologically is that everybody in the business of shellfish becomes a small army of people who are very concerned about water quality. Because, of course, you cannot harvest shellfish any place where the water isn't anything but squeaky clean. The, our state, I'm sure we've all listened to lots of uh, 2020 reports about how terrible seafood is and so on. Most of those kinds of reports really don't apply to Massachusetts. And one of my fondest desires is that the state of Massachusetts would start responding to some of that stuff. Because this state has a, a very, very good water testing uh, program and applies to all shellfish waters, particularly, of course, where clam farms are. Because there's no way you can do any poaching or middle of the night stuff at a clam farm. I mean, it, it is where it is. And, and there's just no, not a lot of room for hanky-panky on account of that. So I, I think that a lot of the coastal towns where there is clam farming going on are finding it quite interesting to have this uh, influence of all these people who are extremely concerned about the water quality in their nearshore waters because their living is tied very much to it. Um, I guess I'll say just a little bit more about it, and then I thought I'd show some slides of, of the process. Uh, it's probably not a, an award-winning slideshow, but it's something. And, uh, and then we can just open, open it up and go back to questions. The, I guess the last thing I really wanted to say at this point was that um, the biggest problem, curiously enough, the biggest problems right now faced by clam farmers, all of whom have just lived through this horrible, windy, windy, windy winter that we just had, which was a horror show for everybody and, and tended to blow those nets all over the place and sling clams from one end of the flat to the next. And nobody knows who's or who's, and uh, a tremendous amount, of course, is lost, and, and this winter was a mess. In comparison, of course, the last couple of winters prior to that were a piece of cake, so everybody's trying to be philosophical about it. But beyond the natural um, events like that, the, the biggest uh, detriment to the industry on the Cape these days, ironically enough, seems to be the state's own envi so-called environmental agencies who are regulating everyone to death. Uh, one of the biggest problems seems to be that the people making these regulations, who of course are big Beacon Hill types, have, tend to have very little understanding. They've almost, very few of them ever been to a clam farm, never seen one. So of course they're up there writing regs for people, you know, and, and it's not a very good match. Curiously enough too, one of the other uh, sociological factors going on in today's milieu for, for all harvesters of natural resources is that a number of envir organized environmental groups um, has, tend to get fairly right Jerry Falwell-ish, fairly right wing, uh, in, in, and attack, so, sort of broad brush strokes, um, many of the harvesters of natural resources. Um, of course, those harvesters wish that the environmental groups would pay more attention to things like storm drain pipes and Polaroid and real threats to the environment. Um, it's a very curious uh, interaction that's going on. Uh, very real, though, for, for uh, f fishermen of all stripes right now, clam farmers among them. So if we want to start the slides, we can uh, see a couple pictures, most of which are taken in Provincetown, some in Wellfleet. 
This one, of course, speaks to itself, just your basic ma map of Cape Cod. I'm sure you all know where, where Provincetown is in Wellfleet. Wellfleet Harbor is, is made in the shade for shellfish, he, uh, which is right here. It's an absolutely wonderful area for, has tremendous amount of plankton, which is one of the keys to uh, growing shellfish, is, of course, an abundant food supply. Oh, and I'm supposed to click them. Here we go. This one is obviously taken through a microscope in the hatchery. Uh, one of the biggest hatcheries where a lot of the seed is bought is right in Dennis. Um, one way to look at uh, spawning clams is very, very easy. You just jack up the water temperature and, and what passes for the sex life of a clam, of course, is that they just start squirting their respective uh, male and female stuff into the water, they bump into each other, those that, that find each other are called zygotes and so on. Um, the real trick of a hatchery is growing the, the proper sized algae to feed these, these guys. Clams are very, very size specific in what they eat. Small, small clams eat small, small microalgae. And you know, as the clam grows, it'll, it'll eat bigger and bigger algae. Clams don't get red tide, by the way, hard clams because they don't eat that size plankton. But th this is a pretty small, as you can tell. This is a little bit bigger. It's formed the shell, and you can see the, if we get this in focus, you can see the size of the clam versus the size of the sand grains here. This is still a little bit underneath the size that's planted. When, when they're planted, they're about four millimeters, which is what you're passing around right now, which is still awfully small. First time, first year I ever planted uh, clams, I was doing it with a friend of mine. We were going to plant 50,000. Well, we th sort of had the idea that 50,000 was a lot, and the hatchery told us to bring some coolers and ice and so on and so forth. So we arrived in a pickup packed with coolers, ice, everything. <laughs> Do you know how much volume 50,000 baby clams takes up? Same thing as a quart of milk. <laughs> so they got a good chuckle on our, on our behalf that time. <laughs> as I said, all, all hatcheries are basically algae facility, and that's what's going on here. Growing, growing algae. Growing more algae <laughs> for the bigger clams. Th this, this was taken. Uh, in that hatchery in Dennis that I mentioned called ARC, Aquacultural Research Corp. This guy here is planting those same baby clams that, that's making their way around the, the room. This bag that he's holding held uh, 20,000. And that's, that's what this, this nursery box right here is going to hold. 20,000 split peas. <laughs> That was Wellfleet, by the way. This is in Provincetown. Now, this is at the end of the summer, after they've grown up to about the dime or quarter size. And, and this person here is trying to get the sand to drain prior to transplanting. More of the same. This is still transplant preparation, but in this one you can see, this is about 15,000 clams right here. These are much more dense in the nursery boxes. I, as I think I mentioned, when, when they're transplanted, which would be in strips up, up here, a little further away from the actual water, uh, it's 50 to the square foot. Here it's probably 500 to the square foot, just for that first summer. Well, there's a funny looking person right there. <laughs> also trying to get the sand to drain. You know how things never go the way you want it to do. And more of the nursery boxes and so on. One of the things that's always happening, of course, the tide's either coming up or going down and it's never quite doing what you wish it were doing at the moment. Now this one you can certainly tell it's Provincetown because <laughs> of the Provincetown Monument. <laughs> you 
can get a pretty good idea of, of the size of these clams in this. All these buoys, which are really, as you can probably tell, an assortment of laundry jugs and so on. And our recycling committee in our town just loves us because we can't recycle these kind of jugs yet, but the shellfish people just take them right off their hands and use them for buoys. And it's basically a, a warning because at high tide, it's uh, 12 or so feet deep, so it's just a warning to let the boaters know where, where all these trays are. As I said, it's 15,000 in each one of these, these boxes. Now it's finally getting to the point where you get them packed up, <clears throat> uh, still in the road to transplanting. And oftentimes what we'll do is uh, make a count of like one of those buckets, you know, so it's sort of subsample to have some idea of the mortality rate at this stage of the, of the game. You know, you planted 15,000. The, the mortality changes radically. Overall, probably, they say that it's a probably maybe 50% average, but, but in, in real life, there is no set average anything, average year at all. The, two years ago, from, from at the nursery level, we figured about 6% uh, mortality, which is almost nothing. Last year, which was a very, very cold summer, and, and I think the, all, the, all the plankton bloomed much later, and the clams basically croaked, starved to death, because the mortality last year was something 50% and maybe worse from 6% the year before. So it, it jumps all over the place. Clams, clams, more clams. So th this is one uh, where these trays are here. This is one clam farm. These trays over here is another clam farm. And then back over here where these trays are is yet a third. So there's, there's three of them just sort of lined up. They basically work as rectangles going back away from the water here. This is in Wellfleet. And again, you get a pretty good sense of size. This one here is sort of a day in the life of a Wellfleet clam farm. In, in the province town area, we tend to use skiffs because um, we, we have to. Over in Wellfleet, they, they are lucky enough to be able to use trucks, which simplifies life quite a lot. These strips here are the grow out strips. So this is the adults, or c coming into adulthood clams here. So this is the nursery area, and this is the, the realm of life. This guy here is a... Uh, raking clams in muddy sand, also in Wellfleet. But one thing about clam farming, it totally ruins you for recreational clamming. Because, <laughs> totally. Because <laughs> in here, it's, it's, it's almost like gravel in a driveway. They're that thick. You know, but, and then, of course, you go out in a re regular old flat you know, with your friends, and it's, like <laughs> it's torture because, of course, the density is so different. This fella here is, is culling. I mentioned that sometimes people do that. And it, it helps the clam farmer to get the slower growers separated from the faster growers. So then when you go to dig them up, you don't have to dig them up quite so many times because they'll all, hopefully all be ready at the same time. Of course, this never quite works out, so you wind up digging them up probably about three times before you're finished. You know, the first time you dig them, a third will be ready, the next time another third, and finally the last time that's the end of it. You, you, as I say, you get on a first-name basis with almost every one of these, these guys. <laughs> Back to Provincetown. And here's the, we've finally gotten away from the boxes and up into the races. And this is, uh, these are all going to be transplanted into this area right here. As I say, the second year, basically, you don't do much with them except uh, check them for moon snails once in a while. And then the third year, You'd be in there digging them up. And there's the very scientific method of, of arriving at 50 to the square foot. <laughs> very scientific, as I said. Covering them over. And 
Not too many people could stand like that and stand back up again, don't you agree? <laughs> this is not me. This is <laughs> This is me about to get a face full of water. Uh, as a, as a <laughs> you're forever, uh, I'm about to hit that nail, and when it gets down to where the water is, the water, of course, bites back, and you get it right in the face. But uh, th that's part of it. You know, you're, you're always, it, it sounds so romantic, you know, working with the tides, but uh, they never tell you that the tide bites back, you know. One day we were out there doing this sort of thing and this friend of mine and I sort of had that kind of sky going on behind us and, and it was so beautiful we could hardly work. And we were looking around and looking around and finally my, I looked at my friend and I said, what an office. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason in the fall when you get the really good tides that give you a lot of working room, they're always right at sunset so you wind up in the dark. And it happens year after year after year. This, it's, Graham would probably be able to explain why this is. Uh, us guys, we just learned to work with it. And here, as you can see, it's actually gotten dark. So we, we, you know those little minor headlamps that they sell, you know, they kind of, <laughs> well, it's become one of my favorite tools. <laughs> Yeah, there I am wearing it right there. Of course, by the next day, then you wind up getting there in the dark, but at least, you know, because the tidal hour gets an hour later, so you sort of start at the morning. And, uh, but at least, at least when that changes around, at least you wind up in the daytime instead of winding up at night. One of these times I was out there by myself, you know, doing exactly what I'm doing. And, and uh, it, you know, there's, there's, there's ghosts out there at Long Point, you know. And uh, they were all around that night, and I was so glad when I got back to town, I'll never be able to tell you. <laughs> That's basically the end of it, coming back home in the skiff. There's an idea of size. The mesh here is about ha half an inch. So that's uh, probably a, a second year clam. There's a third year ready for the raw back. These marks, by the way, you can always tell farm-raised clams looking for these marks. The hatcheries selected for it is a regular clam, is, hard clam is called Mercenaria Mercenaria. These are called Mercenaria Mercenaria Notata, or notations. So they've all got those, almost all got those, those marks right in the shell. And uh, for no particular reason except that they figure someday enough consumers will begin to understand that and recognize it in the market marketplace. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, the farm-raised clams, um, you can be really sh assured of in terms of quality uh, control and seafood safety and all that, because as I say, clam farmers, there's no way they could be hauling stuff out of the Taunton River in the middle of the night. I threw in a couple of slides of oyster farming. There's also a lot of oyster farming, some oyster farming going on. Oysters, though, because of that disease I mentioned, is a, is a much trickier business uh, and will continue to be so until modern medicine learns to conquer MSX. But one of the other problems, of course, is codium, which is the seaweed, uh, a Japanese import, I understand, and it must have come over on Toyota boats. Uh, the problem with it is that it, it, its flotation uh, quotient is quite high and it'll attach to the shell, grow, and, and the oysters will start floating. In wintertime, it'll float them way up high on the shore and then they'll, they'll freeze when the tide goes down, that sort of thing. We could attach notes to them maybe and see where they go. <laughs> this, uh, this show is MSX. I, I probably, you know, that's a healthy one. That one's got MSX in it. Now that's abundance, isn't that? That's all oysters. Isn't that something? That's again Wellfleet. This must have been one of the years where the MSX was sort of low because they were, they were living, obviously. One of the, uh, this, this picture was taken over at Dick Nelson's in Contua at the 
he's uh, gathering the predators to the oysters. Believe it or not, they still pack oysters in wooden barrels. Isn't that reassuring? <laughs> I just love this guy, so I thought I'd toss this one in. <laughs> This is the end of the show, and it just shows the first clam farmers down at the Pamet River, I believe. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's it. Questions? <laughs> Graham, I was wondering if we could affix maybe a reel to this. It's, it's, uh... <laughs> Anybody got any questions? I'd be glad to. You had 12-foot uh, uh, tides out there in Provincetown. We sure do. What happens when the waves come in and they uh, southwesterly, I guess, on those beds there? What effect does that have on those boxes and the clam uh, All hell breaks loose, uh, basically. <laughs> the the Provincetown clam farmers go through, suffer wind damage a lot more than Wellfleet. Wellfleet's much more protected. Uh, the worst direction is easterlies. So, which tends to be the dominant wind in the wintertime. And, and this winter, well, as my friends all say, they, they, we, we sure wish these 100-year storms would come along once every 100 years. Because <laughs> this winter, it's been one every two weeks. So it, they, the boxes are only a function of summertime. And by, by fall, you will have transplanted them and taken the boxes home. But what the winds do is they'll lift the, the nets right up and the clams will blow out. And, and uh, one of my main, to this has happened to me so many times this winter. You know, we'll have a storm, I'll go out there, I'll pick them all back up, I'll put them back in a race, cover them back up, go home, a week later go through it again. My main tool has become a plastic shovel and a plastic bucket. <laughs> and, and it's sort of good for the ego to find yourself uh, as a grown-up working with uh, kid toys, but it, it works great, <laughs> and it keeps your sense of humor right up there. <laughs> I saw some more hands, I believe. Yeah. Is the uh, land that the clam farmers lease state land, or is it owned by private individuals? The, com <laughs> the Commonwealth of Massachusetts believes that it owns the land from, from low tide down. Um, as some of you may know, there's this very, uh, very interesting uh, ba court battle going on right now in Truro, where this one lone Truro's lonely clam farmer set up a clam farm basically below mean low tide. A motel that is up several football fields away said, brought suit saying, claiming the land. It went to one of Barnstable Superior Court's finer judges who ruled that the property owner has rights to the land all the way to extreme low tide. This decision has ramifications way bigger than the lonely clam farmer in Truro. The state, of, the Commonwealth, all the Chapter 91 licenses, I mean, the states handed out all kinds of licenses for peers, uh, the, all the big ducks at uh, the power plants in Salem. And if this decision holds, the Commonwealth doesn't have rights to, to the inter that intertidal zone at all. I, the, tune in to News at 11 on this one, because it's clearly uh, being appealed. Um, I suspect the state is going to come in as a friend of the court on this one. Um, so it's, it's on its way to the appellate court now, and I wouldn't at all be surprised if it then goes on to uh, Superior Court. One of the other things at issue is uh, the judge also said that structures were not fishing. Um, if I were to talk to, to the judge, which of course I won't, because being no lawyer, thank goodness, in some people's opinion, uh, I would point out that all fishing involves structures. Nobody catches fish with their bare hands <coughs> or shellfish. I mean, even a person standing with a surf rod it, themselves is a structure and are using a structure, or use boats, use lobster pots, you, all sorts of things, you know. But this judge said that the, as I said, the net, especially the net that are on covering the races, is, is basically like laying a sheet on the sand, you know. 
this judge said it was illegal. So this is, you know, more news at 11 on, on, on this one. Right. A lot of this, of course, keys back to the colonial ordinance of 1641, which gave the public the right to, to walk, to be in the intertidal zone uh, for, the, for the purposes of fishing, fowling, and, and navigation. The curious thing about this colonial ordinance, Massachusetts, one of the very few states that has this, this, this rule. Um, and the reason it does in, uh, and differentiates it from the, the other uh, states is that Massachusetts, back in the 1600s, was trying to encourage maritime industries. And it figured at that time, if it gave the property owners rights, that they would feel comfortable as a business decision to build a pier. That perhaps nobody would want to build a pier if, on what might be considered public property, because it might not make business sense. So it gave the property owners extra property rights, all toward, as I said, trying to develop maritime uh, activity, commerce. In 1993, of course, this is all working quite differently in preventing those who would operate maritime commerce from getting to the beach or getting their feet wet. So it's all gotten quite tip-top, turvy But uh, that picture of the Indian ought to, ought to, ought to prove that uh, that's what the colonists had in mind. We, we hope. Yeah, the question was if you have to be a resident in the town. Um, most towns say yes. Uh, of course, then you get, you can look at people like Leona Helms who have 60 homes throughout the world and, and, and ask the question, well, where are you a resident? Um, in my town, we ask you like, where's your car insurance? Where's your car registered? Because well, we're the end of the line, and, and for some, you know, Massachusetts kind of reason, having a car registered in Provincetown, you pay higher rates than the, anywhere else. So if, if your car's registered in Provincetown, that's proof enough to us that you really live there. <laughs> Pardon me? The way it works legally is that the state owns the, the intertidal zone, or so they believed until this recent court decision. However, in, in regards to the shell fisheries, they hand administration of all matters to do with shellfish over to the towns. So each town has jurisdiction over grants and over wild shell fisheries and recreational and so on. Not all towns on Cape Cod allow shellfish grants. Some towns like Bourne, I believe, have been arguing about it for years and years. Um, there are those who would love to be able to start growing shellfish. There are other people in, in the town, I understand, who are worried to death that if people started, you know, because they, they, you are privatizing some of the bottom when you do that, and they're worried that they, the public, will, will, lose, will lose out. I, 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 I find that when people begin to understand that it's really the only crappy, useless kind of, kind of bottom that's possible to use, you know, everyone's interests are very much protected. What effect do you think the outfall pipe might have on this whole industry? Clam farmers are terrified about the outfall pipe because uh, we're all on Cape Cod Bay, of course. And as you all know, the, the path of circulation goes from, Bo from Boston down into Cape Cod Bay. It takes about two months and it finally comes out between Tip of Provincetown and Stellwagen Bank. One of the biggest reasons that people, the clam farmer, farming community is worried on two basic fronts. One, if the kind of nutrient source coming out of the outfall pipe uh, develops a dominant kind of plankton, let's assume that one, perhaps one kind of plankton will thrive on this particular food source and, and just you know, wipe out every other kind of plankton. And what if this one kind of plankton isn't what the clams eat? We're dead. The other reason that clam farmers are quite concerned about it is that right now we get a, a sort of a special market niche by having Cape Cod clams. You say Cape Cod and people think clean, they think green, fresh, you know, um, as compared to say New Jersey, New Jersey clams. Well there's parts in New Jersey that are far more rural than anywhere on Cape Cod. And they do, of course, do shell fisheries there. But the perception of New Jersey 
is such that nobody wants to eat them. If Cape Cod starts getting that kind of association with the outfall pipe, there goes. In many cases, reality is what you say it is, particularly in the world of advertising. So there's that concern, too. Has anybody in this impact study uh, asked you about this and been concerned about this industry? The Bayes Legal Defense Fund, which is the consortium of all the towns that have pretty much pulled their money to see what they can do, have, have, they've talked uh, extensively to a lot of the clam farmers. I believe a lot of the clam farmers were early on some of the early whistleblowers to try and bring attention to it, which is what, about two years ago, I guess, when everybody woke up and went, oh my goodness, what are they doing, right? Uh, does this strictly have to be salt water? What I mean is where you have freshwater springs some places that, that come back into the ocean. Uh, would that affect the clams? Yes and no. There's some right, right where those, those grants, where I was working, there's some of those upwellings. Um, I, try and not, I try and figure out, in fact, I've been talking to Graham about this quite a lot, and now I run around with my salinity meter trying to really figure out where they are, simply because I, I, I would like to not plant clams right there because of ice, concerns about ice. If you get that fresh water in the wintertime, in the clams, you got ice, where it's salt water you wouldn't. Other than that, it doesn't really matter. In terms of oysters, however, oysters like that salinity mix which is, again, why Wellfleet's such a great place for oysters, because they've got the, the river going in right there. But other than that, it's, but it's basically a saltwater thing. There's certain salinities that quahogs prefer, but uh, it's a fairly tolerant thing, and just about anywhere in Cape Cod it, uh, is within the range. Have you tried anything else other than the nets for predator protection? There's some work. Shotguns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's some work done down at Bims uh, where they use gravel. Protecting, uh, the yeah, that's pretty old style. Um, Phil Schwind, I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, but he's one of the old-time shellfish wardens in East Ham. With, with old time, but he had the, the guy had tremendous vision and was one of the early uh, pioneers in this whole thing. Used, used rock, used, you know, to cover up the clams, protect them again from the crabs and the ducks. Uh, the problem with that is first off lugging all those stones out there and then trying to dig through it all to it's a, it's a much more problematic kind of thing than than a net you know you can put that down you can take it away and put it in the garbage it's sort of tidier <laughs> and much easier when the time comes to dig the clams yeah Uh, down here, I don't know. Um, one, one of the craziest things about marketing, uh, and I can talk for hours about marketing because <laughs> it drives me crazy. Uh, in the supermarkets where I live, the supermarkets are Orleans, say, the, the biggest ones. Um, they hardly ever carry shell. I mean, Orleans is in the heart of shellfish for the whole state. Cape Cod produces more shellfish than anywhere else in Massachusetts. And, the, and that section around Orleans is the heart of it all. The stop and spend or stop and save or whatever they call it. Lord knows where the shellfish is from. It's never local. Um, most of the clam farm product is, uh, some of it just sort of goes into the Quahog stream, as it were. But a lot of it, most of it winds up in restaurants. Some of it winds up in retail stores. Um, I was selling some at the A&P in, in my town last summer. But it was an awful lot of hassle. And I don't know if I'll do it again. Marketing. <laughs> so over this three year period that your uh, co-hogs are in the water, do they spawn? They definitely do. They, they, they throw out spawn the second year. So that must be quite an advantage Yeah, um, one of my hats is I'm chairman of the shellfish committee in my town, you know, and, and looking at the, at the public flats. And one, <coughs> since we now have this huge amount of, of spat in the water, um, we, our research has led us to believe that, that what we need to do next is, is some habitat work in the public flats. When, when I've asked the experts, why isn't there the shellfish today that there used to be? And in my town, don't tell me it's overfishing. I mean, we have one little day of rinky-dinky day of family 
clamming a week. It's hardly fishing pressure. Uh, the experts tell me the answer about why have shellfish stocks gone down are two. One is underfishing. Uh, in the old days, you had all those people out there raking the, raking the sand, raking sand and turning the bottom over. When that stops, all the organic acids settle in that top half an inch, making that sand sort of larvae unfriendly. So when, you know, when you just have a f couple of people out there once a week raking here and there, so what we've been trying to address that is, uh, you know, our warden will go out there literally with a with a rototiller. Sometimes we've got a little hydraulic rig, we'll we'll run over, and just sort of just turns the sand over. <clears throat> uh, we did a an acre or so a year ago, and the difference is phenomenal. In in one year, there's like you can tell exactly where 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 it got turned over because it's loaded with clams, and right over here, there's hardly a, a sea worm. So, so that, that's made a huge difference. I, I was figuring out um, two years ago, just given the, I figured out how many clams there were had been planted in my town that year. And, you know, take an average of, you know, there are these things, the averages of how much spawn they would throw out, and figured out that it was something like nine billion larvae had been <laughs> spawned in my town, that, in Provincetown that, that, that season. And I was thinking, gee, we could put up a sign like McDonald's, you know. <laughs> Nine million larvae. <coughs> Do you think the theory you just uh, quoted just now about the uh, underfished, uh, so to speak, when you go around the rotor would that pertain to offshore also? In relation to shellfish? Uh, as far as the elasticity, as far as the salmon are concerned, as far as not being overturned all the time? Um. With any kind of shellfish? It, it would apply to any kind of shellfish. Like if you've ever watched a brand, well, like Graham, if you've ever watched a brand new sandbar form, you know, the first thing that's going to live there really is going to be steamers. If that thing stabilizes, it becomes a place of crabs and worms. You know, but if it's worked, it'll, it'll stay clammy. Do you believe that offshore, as far as inshore, there would be, as far as like the farm and cultivating the property, uh, on the same idea as far as being overfished, being underfished? Well, offshore, I mean, most shellfish is really a nearshore phenomenon. You know, you get offshore and it's a whole other kind of shellfish that grows out there, you know, the ocean cohog, sea clams, that sort of thing. So it, that's in a whole other world. I've seen offshore where cohogs, sea clams, for instance, uh, you'd find nothing, especially in the Northeast Peak area, or on our side, they uh -huh. like find the cohogs, empty shells, and we'd always assume that it was always dead bottom. And after the Northeast storm, when you went out there, all you did was get live cohogs. They did upturn the whole bottom and never get a fish done. That could be. And they claimed that it was overfished and they were dead and they which they weren't. No, but it could have it very well have been underfished because after a point, just like perch in a, in a freshwater pond, they'll just get to be so abundant and fighting for each other for the available food supply that they'll stunt and they'll literally starve to death. Right. I've, seen, I've seen that happen with sea, cl sea clam beds. Okay, one more question. Uh, on grants, how would you acquire a grant? What would be the formality of going about to proceed to get a grant for whatever farming may be in that uh, agriculture? First, you've got to talk your town into having that kind of program. In my town, in Wellfleet, they've had grants since, since, since before there was Indians, just about. In Provincetown, there, were, there was no commercial fishery and no grants up until about four or five years ago. And, and uh, me, to about three people, went, and I was one of them, went to the selectmen. And we, there was no existing system whatsoever, so we sort of made up our own application forms and applied for a shellfish grant. Our, our selectmen happened to be kind of friendly types and said, OK. Then there was like a land rush, uh, very like Oklahoma. It was, it was an amazing sociological phenomenon because for about a year there, everybody in town thought they were going to turn into clam millionaires. Yeah. And we're all running in to apply for grants. So the town said, whoa, and let's just a little, little moratorium here, get organized, read other towns' grant regulations, and so on and so forth, adopt some regulations, blah, blah, blah. Did all of that, reopened it. And uh, you know, the thing's cooking along pretty good today. But it, it, it is through the town. The, the, the actual procedure is you, you get, you usually have to go through your town's shellfish advisory committee onto the selectmen, get their okay, then it goes to the state, 
As I say, they literally send down a biologist wearing rubber boots. Um, you know, if the area uh, meets their standards, then it's yours. When you look for grants, what my question was, was, so to speak, is what do they look for as far as what information do you have to provide to them to prove to them that it justifies a grant? The, the, the key, one of the key things is, as I said, it has to be no natural clams. So you, you look for a barren area. In my town, it's, it's, all, it's almost all barren area. Um, when I was at that stage, being one of the pioneers of it in Provincetown, I was on the phone with Graham all the time because I knew that I wanted stable sand. Hey, Graham, how do you tell stable sand, I'd say. And uh, he'd tell me a few things, and we'd, I'd go out there and look. What I, what I wound up doing was taking little bits of chicken wire and a couple tent pegs, and I just went all over the flats and sort of tapped, tapped it in, just samples, you know, all over the place, and waited a few months and waited to see which ones got covered up and which ones didn't. It was kind of rudimentary, but it worked. It told me where the stable areas were. And of course, you want to stay away from eelgrass. Um, but other than that, that's about it. S stability. Yeah? I'm from Bocasset, and we've had our beds closed for three and a half years due to uh, pollution. This year, they're open. Cool. We're really clamming out there. So can we conclude from what you said that in the next year, the clams, assuming we don't have the pollution, the clams are going to be a lot better because of all this aeration of the uh, bottom. Yeah, I would assume that that it would definitely sweeten up the bottom so that the ne yeah that the larvae will will be much more likely to take, and and it should be an ongoing process. Yeah. What kind of players do you have besides uh, snails and crabs? Those are the two biggest. Um, we have the toe people. <laughs> who come? <laughs> oh, you have so many clams here. Surely I can. <laughs> um, and and eiders, eiders can can be big predators. Um, I just noticed in my town there happened to be a big set of mussels from a couple of years ago that was on the sand, and the whole bed is totally gone because uh, we, we got a flock of eiders in about two weeks ago, and I just went out the other day, and there's no more mussels in this particular area. Um, and gulls, I've no, I have, in my town, like everywhere else, they cl we're, we're all closing our landfills, right? Well, in my town, the, the dump was the best source of food for all the seagulls. Well, there's not so much going on at the dump anymore, so the seagulls are getting a little more uh, creative. And until last winter, I'd never seen a seagull dig for clams. <laughs> you know, of course, they'll take them that are sitting out on top, right, easy ones. But now they're getting a little bit more hungrier and a little bit smarter. And, and these gulls had figured out um, where I had some clams. And I didn't have a net on it because it was winter and there's no crabs around. And I thought this would be fine. And I'd never seen a gull dig for clams before. And I was over my grant somewhere doing something. And I saw this gull fly away with one of the cl my clams. I went, huh, you know, it must have been one that was on top. So I walked over, you know, and I st stuck everything that was sticking up down. Went back to what I was doing. 20 minutes later, there's the gull flying by. <laughs> you know, so it, it took me forever. My mind did not want to accept the fact that these gulls are digging clams. So it took me months to really believe it. But uh, yeah, you know, the, the, the lesson was netted over because the gulls are learning to dig, have learned to dig clams. And, and just to tell you how stupid I am, that, that they got me for about at least two, bu two bushels before I really believed it. So uh, we all get so, you know, headstrong, you know. Yeah. How's your uh, relationship with the local conservation? In my town, it's quite good. Um, you know, we, we talked at length with them before doing anything. All of our grants are sort of set up in, in two areas, uh, you know, where you could sort of draw a circle on the map. And, and, and inside those circles, it's basically like a parking lot. Grant, 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 grant. Um, we also conferred very closely with them on access issues. That's, that's the pro probably the proper involvement of a conservation commission with clam farming. It's not the actual shellfish farm, but there might be issues about how you get there. Now, in our town, one of our areas is only accessible by boat. So, so that's that. The other area is accessible by truck. So, you know, we've talked to them about that and, and they've and worked it out quite quite well. So prepping the bottom doesn't uh, fall under the jurisdiction of the conservation? 
Now, it, the activity is so insignificant. I mean, it's so small what you're doing. You know, you, you, you're not like tearing up 40 acres to build a mall, you know. You're, <laughs> you're just talking about this little place here, you know. And it all goes back to what it was before you've even left the, the, the place. So uh, it, it's really insignificant. At one point, the Corps of Engineers was all over clam farmers. You know, oh my god, you're dredging and filling and you need all these permits and all that stuff. And they finally, once they, again, once they realized really how, how low tech and how lo low impact all of this stuff is, they finally said they got off the case. <laughs> well, to help you plan your, uh, your own clam farms, Molly has a model set up down here, so uh, yeah. uh, after, uh, after the talk, uh, we can all come down and look at that, and, and I'm sure Molly would be willing to sure. ask more questions after the talk. So let's say Molly wants to talk.